On the 30th of January 1649, on a cold morning in London, a huge crowd had gathered on Whitehall outside of the banqueting house. Out from a window stepped King Charles I, the King of England, Scotland and Ireland, who was awaiting his moment with the executioner. Charles I had lost the English Civil War, and because of this he was being executed at the hands of Parliament, spearheaded by Oliver Cromwell. The execution of Charles I was one of the most shocking moments in history, as a king was being executed by his own people after being found guilty of betraying them and of treason. It was a moment that was felt all over Europe, and still today the story of Charles's brutal treatment and execution captivates the world. But there were a group of men who were responsible for the execution of the king, and these became known as the regicides. But following the restoration of the monarchy, when Charles II, Charles I's son, came onto the throne, there was an incredible hunt for those people who sentenced the king to death, and what happened to some of them was barbaric. Join us today as we look at the regicides, the men that executed the English king, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Following the trial of King Charles I, there were 59 commissioners or judges that signed the death warrant of the king. This included the court officials and the judges, along with a number of prominent members of parliament, and even Oliver Cromwell signed the death warrant. When Charles I saw the execution scaffold, he would state that an unjust sentence that I suffered to take effect is punished now by an unjust sentence on me. He would state on his way to the execution that, I must tell you that their liberty and freedom consists in having government. It is not their having a share in the government. That is nothing appertaining unto them. A subject and a sovereign are clean different things. But I shall go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be. He was critical of Parliament until the very last moments, but there had been an issue up until the execution. Parliament struggled to find an executioner who would take the head off the king. The common hangman of London was approached, but he refused, despite being offered huge sums of money. Some believe that this man did eventually relent after he was threatened with death, but there were other candidates who took the life of the king. At 2pm, Charles I put his head on the block in front of the crowd, and he said a prayer and signalled to the executioner that he was ready, and he stretched out his hands. In one swift strike from the axe, his head was taken clean off, alluding to the fact that the man who took the life of the king was a very skilled axeman. He then held up the head of the king, but did not utter the traditional words of, Behold the head of a traitor. But then after the execution, the head of the king was sewn back onto the body, and was then embalmed and placed in a lead coffin. But after this, Oliver Cromwell would establish Puritan laws and rule across England, and with this many people were not happy. They would later regret the execution of the king, and after Cromwell's death and the failings of his son, the restoration of the monarchy would occur, and onto the throne came King Charles II. Charles II was obviously the son of the executed king, and he would then go on the offensive to punish the people responsible for the execution of his father. In 1660, Parliament would quickly pass the Indemnity and Oblivion Act, and this gave amnesty to those who supported Parliament during the Civil War, However, 104 people were excluded from this, and of those who were named, 49 of them and two unknown executioners were to face a capital charge. Charles and Parliament would take a very strong line. Of those who were listed to have been subject to punishment and even execution, there were 24 of them who had already died. However, for three men who were buried, they would not be spared any punishment. Oliver Cromwell, John Bradshaw and Henry Ireton had all died, and Bradshaw was a judge who was the president of the court. These men were all subjected to a posthumous execution. Their remains and bodies were dug up. Cromwell's took some time digging up from Westminster Abbey. They were then taken to Tyburn where they were hanged in chains, and then beheaded by an executioner. With Cromwell, his remains had decayed to the point where the executioner struggled to hack his head from his body, and following this their heads were placed on spikes above Westminster Hall, and also the bodies were thrown into a pit below the gallows. But further executions continued. In 1660, six of the commissioners and four others were found guilty of the crime of regicide, killing a king, and were executed. Samuel Pepys wrote that on the 15th of October 1660, this morning Mr Carew was hanged and quartered at Charing Cross, 
but his quarters by great favour, and not to the hanged up. I saw the limbs of some of our new traitors set upon Aldersgate, which was a sad sight to see, and a bloody week this and the last have been, there being ten hanged, drawn and quartered. Three more regicides two years later were hanged, drawn and quartered, and some did get a pardon, with nineteen being sentenced to life imprisonment. The regicides, as they were known, had their property confiscated, and many were banned from holding any position of power or job ever again. Those who were smart and anticipated the upcoming threat to them would flee to Europe, and twenty-one of those managed to settle away from Britain, living their lives in the Netherlands or Switzerland. Some did come back, and those were captured, or were murdered by royalist sympathisers. John Dixwell, William Goff, and Edward Wally were all hunted in New England, but these escaped punishment as they managed to hide out. Peter Temple was one of those who was captured alive, and he was brought to trial, and was then sentenced to death. However, as he was ill, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, and in 1663 he died inside of the Tower of London. Another man who was executed was John Harrison, who was captured alive, and he was the first to be found guilty of regicide. He was one of those at Charing Cross executed, and he was seen as a threat to the Restoration, and he was a leader of the Fifth Monarchists. Owen Rowe also had a similar fate to Peter Temple, as he would be sentenced to death, but would die inside the Tower of London, whilst awaiting his execution. The exact same happened to Vincent Potter, who also died in the Tower. Sir William Constable, the first baronet, had died in June 1655, and he was shockingly given a state funeral inside of Westminster Abbey. But following the restoration of the monarchy, his body was exhumed from the abbey, and it was then thrown into a communal burial pit in St Margaret's Churchyard, Westminster, in an act of ultimate disgrace. John Barkstead was arrested, and he was sent back to England, where he was then executed. Miles Corbett, was captured inside of the Netherlands, and he was arrested by Sir George Downing, the English ambassador to the Netherlands. He was sent back to England as well, and he was also found guilty, was then hanged, drawn and quartered, in April 1662. But the regicides were those who were considered the evil men that executed the King of England. Across England, the King's execution was a divisive act, and many would come back to regret what happened on that cold January morning in London. The list of regicides was considered an early blacklist, and Charles II would state, If any innocent soul be found in this blacklist, let him not be offended at me, but consider whether some mistake principle or interest may not mislead him to vote. Charles II, when he came onto the throne, wanted those, in particular, who ordered his father's brutal death to be punished horrifically. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.